This is going to be fun. So I talk a lot about how there is no diet that is right for every person because we all process foods differently. So a viewer wrote in last week and he's like, hey, how do you figure out what is the perfect diet for you? So I figured I'd walk through this a little bit and help you understand some of the things that I look at when I'm helping clients really adjust their diet to them. So some important points that I want you to remember is that I don't want you to follow anybody's rules. I want you to do what's right for you. So I don't want you to follow, oh, I gotta have this amount of calories or I'm gonna do what all the keto gurus tell me to do or what all the paleo gods are saying. I don't want you to follow that. I want you to follow your body. Now, that doesn't mean that, hey, my body says I wanna eat a bag of donuts. You know, that's not really what I'm saying. I want you to understand how to look at your chemistry and understand how to work with your body a little bit. So another thing that will be important to understand is we have to figure out what the goals are. Are we, are we trying to lose weight? Are we trying to add muscle? Are we trying to fix specific health issues? You need to look at your priorities and then that's going to dictate a lot of what kind of steps that you're going to take. We also want to learn how to work with our body instead of against it. A lot of people will do things to lose weight just because, hey, everybody says this is what you do to lose weight. I'm going to burn more calories than I eat. So now I got to create this deficit even though my body thinks I'm a jerk every time I do it. So in order to really get your body into a good state, it needs to feel good about what's going on. So we want to learn how to work with our body. We also want to remove burdens. It's not just about giving the body what it needs. We want to remove things that are creating trouble in our body because the foods that can help one person can cause a lot of trouble and harm for somebody else. We also want to eat smart, real food. So if you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to do keto. My friend lost a lot of weight on keto, so I'm going to eat every packaged food that says keto on the label. That's going to create a lot of trouble. And maybe somebody can lose weight doing that because their body is operating at a higher level. But when somebody is dealing with any type of malfunctions or imbalances, all that processed junk is going to create a lot of trouble. So we want to eat real food but we also want to be smart about it. We don't want to be eating all these processed seed oils and all these vegetable oils and all these trans fat kind of things. We want to give the body things that it can use. So we're going to walk through some physiological markers here and help you understand how to figure out your perfect diet. TC Hill is not a doctor and does not claim to be a doctor or licensed in any type of medical field. Don't be an idiot and use anything heard on the show as medical advice. This information should be used for educational purposes only and you should contact your doctor for any medical advice. Now get off me. So when we're trying to create the perfect diet, I really like people to look at physiological markers that they can test at home on their own. That way, when their body chemistry starts to change, they can make adjustments to their diet to continue to work with their body. So I talk about all of these things in a lot more depth in my book, Kick Your Fat in the Nuts. So in this video, if I don't do a great job of getting it all into one video, I've never really tried to do that, I'm going to put a link in the description below where you can get the whole thing totally for free. So it's available on Amazon, but you can find a link in the description so you can just get the whole book for free and that'll kind of walk you through some of these tests that I'm talking about, some of these malfunctions and imbalances, and it'll dig a lot deeper into it. So just in case this is a little confusing, you can dig as deep as you want when you get that book for free. But first, let's look at blood sugar because this is a big deal when someone's trying to figure out a diet, you know, in most cases they really want to lose weight or uh, tone up or, you know, improve their appearance so that more people will want to be naked with them. So we want to look at blood sugar because often that's a really big factor when we're trying to lose weight or change our appearance. And what we want to know is we want to look at our fasting blood sugar. So right when you wake up, you want to check your fasting blood sugar. And if it's over a hundred, that can give us an indication that we're not processing glucose as efficiently as we might want to. Maybe we're starting to lean a little bit on that insulin resistance side. And that can become a factor when we're trying to select the type of foods we're eating. If that fasting blood sugar is under 70, that could let us know that maybe we're processing that glucose a little too aggressively. Maybe we're leaning on that hypoglycemic side. And if we eat too many carbohydrates in one meal, that can create a spike and then a crash in blood sugar. And the reason that can be a really big problem is because when our blood sugar crashes, if we don't have enough nutrients and minerals in the system to kind of buffer that sugar crash, then that can create a lot of trouble. Like it'll spike, you know, a lot of stress hormones like estrogen. 
And some of these stress hormones like estrogen or cortisol, they can lead the body into issues that are gonna create more fat storage. So a person is trying to lose weight, but they're creating these spikes and crashes in blood sugar, and that can really magnify that weight gain issue. So we wanna know where this is to help us dictate a little bit more about the types of carbohydrates or the level of carbohydrates that we'll be consuming. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. Let's come up here to this digestive capacity. And in my opinion, this is the biggest factor when it comes to creating the right diet for you. Because people eat all these foods and they're like, travel the earth to find the most nutrient rich foods. Or I'm gonna drive across town so I can buy all these organic, cram it in a bag as it's pulled out of a tree kind of food. But the problem is, if somebody can't digest that food, it's going to rot and ferment and become this toxic gook that creates a burden for the body. So remember, we wanted to look at removing burdens. So we have to look at our digestive capacity. We need to understand, do I have the ability to break down proteins? If I can't break down proteins correctly because I'm not making enough stomach acid, we need stomach acid to break that down, then that's gonna create a little bit of trouble. So let's look at how this is supposed to work. When we eat food, our stomach makes hydrochloric acid or HCL. And that HCL is to help us start acidifying that food so that we can break it down. And it's very important when it comes to proteins. And once that food is acidified enough, it'll leave the stomach and come in here to the duodenum, which is like the first 10 inches of the small intestine. And that's when this gallbladder will squirt alkaline bile down onto the acidic product that left the stomach. So what happens is this acidic product meets this alkaline bile coming from the gallbladder, and when they collide, it creates a sizzle. And that sizzle really helps us bust the food apart and pull all the nutrients out of that food. So the problem is, it's really common for people not to be making enough stomach acid today. And it's really common for someone's bile to become too thick and sticky to flow correctly. Now the other thing about bile is that we use bile to emulsify or break down our dietary fats. So if someone's bile is not flowing correctly, they can't emulsify those fats so that they can be broken down to the point where the body can use them. When fats can't be broken down properly, they become rancid and toxic and they become a burden that the body has to deal with. So we know now that eating more dietary fats is beneficial, especially when we're trying to lose fat. We wanna give the body these dietary fats that it needs so it's more willing to let go of those stored fats. But if someone can't process those fats correctly, those fats just become a problem and then the body's gotta to try to figure out what to do with them. Well, I can shove some of them in these fat cells and then our fat cells expand and then our pants don't fit. So these two aspects of digestion are crucial when it comes to losing weight or improving health issues. And if either side of digestion is not working correctly, then we don't get that sizzle and we can't really bust the food apart. So this is a really big deal. And when we're looking at these digestive factors, if we can't digest protein correctly, then we need to eat a smaller amount of protein or we need to adjust that malfunction so that we can digest our protein correctly. If you're not sure, we'll put a link in the description below for our video on 10 signs of low stomach acid, and you can check that out to see, oh, I'm dealing with a lot of things that kind of are signs of low stomach acid. Maybe I need to correct that issue so that I can eat more protein. Because a lot of people really want to reduce their carbohydrates when they're trying to lose weight, but when you do that, if you can't digest protein, your body's like, hey, I hate you. This feels like a rock just sitting in my stomach for six hours. I don't want this. Give me more of those vanilla wafers. I could break those down really easy. So that becomes a problem when somebody wants to lose weight if they can't digest proteins correctly. If they can't emulsify fats, hey, my friend lost a lot of weight on keto. I'm gonna do keto. I'm gonna eat like all fat, but I can't emulsify my fats, so that's probably not gonna go so great, is it? You're just gonna give this body this huge burden where the fat that it can't process, that's gonna create a problem. So we wanna know, do we have the ability to create that sizzle? Is bile flowing correctly? And are we making enough stomach acid? Because if you can't, you can't pull the minerals or the nutrients out of the food that you're eating and guess what the body's gonna do? It's going to scream for more stuff. When you eat that food, you're sending a signal to the body that says, hey, here comes the stuff you were looking for. 
but when it can't be broken down properly, the body's going to say, hey, what, whatever that stuff you said you were going to send me, I was getting stuff, where'd it go? It never gets the nutrients that it needs, so it's going to create cravings and scream for more junk. So this lack of sizzle is one of the biggest things that creates problems for people who just can't stop eating. So doesn't it make sense that if a guy can only break down his cheeseburgers to get like 10% of the nutrients out of that cheeseburger, doesn't it make sense that he would need to eat 10 cheeseburgers to get the same amount of nutrients that somebody else might get from one. So we want to make sure that we can digest the food correctly, the body can get what it's looking for, and then it's not going to scream for all this junk and all these cravings are not going to derail every attempt that we make. And that kind of brings us down to these carb requirements. So what happens is we want to look at what kind of minerals do we have in this system. And you can get an idea of where your mineral levels are by just looking at your blood pressure. You want to look at it at least two hours after a meal, but not first thing in the morning when you're fasted. It should be after a meal. But if that systolic number, which is the top number, is lower than 112, that's a really strong indication that there might not be enough minerals in the system. Minerals are part of what thicken up the blood and raise our blood pressure. So if our blood pressure is low, that can be a sign of low minerals. So the number one reason for minerals to go low is an inability to break that food down and pull the minerals out of that food. So the problem is when minerals are low, we don't have that buffering system that helps us continue to function correctly when blood sugar goes low. So if blood sugar hits a bit of a crash, we don't have enough minerals there to, to kind of keep that system buffered and then we're really going to go cravings or we're really going to go mental or we're really going to go emotional and it's going to make things very difficult. So if we don't have enough minerals in the system and we're looking at bl low blood pressure, we really want to increase the amount of carbs that we're eating to buffer those low minerals until we can bring those minerals up. Now that doesn't mean you want to eat a bunch of bread and pizza and pasta just because your minerals are low. You want to eat what we call medium carb foods that can supply your body with more carbohydrates but not so many that you create this huge spike and then a crash. So medium carb foods are things like sweet potatoes and butternut squash and yams and stuff like that. So that's what's important to understand is do I need a little bit more carbs because my low blood pressure is making it difficult to really lower the carbs. A lot of people try to lower their carbs too aggressively because they understand that that will bring insulin down and allow the body to access stored fat for fuel. So they really want to drop those carbs, but when they drop them too low and they don't have enough minerals to buffer that, then it can create cravings and a whole lot of trouble. So if a person is going to go to a ketogenic diet, then they can really lower those carbs, but they might have to take the right steps to do that successfully. And if you want to figure out if your body's set up to succeed on a ketogenic diet, we'll put a link in the description below for our video on who should not use a keto diet, and that'll help you figure some of that stuff out. But when we're looking at our carb requirements, we want to know, can we process carbs? So maybe our minerals are low, but maybe our blood sugar is high, indicating that we're not processing carbohydrates correctly. And if we're not processing carbohydrates correctly, then when we're eating a lot of carbohydrates, we're just giving the body a burden. We're giving it this fuel source that it doesn't have the ability to process because we're leaning too far on that insulin resistant side. So when that's the case, if we're leaning too insulin resistant, we may need to really lower those carbohydrates and especially in specific windows. We like to have people eat their carbohydrates in a window of time so that there's a longer window of the day and into the night where insulin can really come down and then the cells can start to become more receptive to that insulin and then the person can become less insulin resistant. So it's important to understand how many carbs do you need and how many carbs do I qualify to eat without creating a burden for my body? That can be a big factor. The next thing we want to look at is this circadian rhythm status. And to see what this can do, we want to look at the fact that it was Dr. Emmanuel Rivisi who helped us understand that the body has a natural circadian rhythm at the cellular level. And during the day, the body should be in a more catabolic state where the body is very good at creating energy and kind of keeping us going all day. And it's good at breaking down tissues and things so that they can be rebuilt and renewed. And at night, the body will move into an anabolic state where it's really good at resting and repairing and sleeping. So you can see that both of these states are appropriate. They're, they both have benefits. But the problem is some people will get stuck too far in one of these states too often. And when you're pushing too far in one direction, it can create a lot of health problems. In an overly catabolic state, we see things like insomnia, because a, a 
at the cellular level, the body's kind of like, hey, go, 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 go. And now there's other causes of insomnia too, but this is just a common cause of insomnia. We see things like loose stools. And if you're dealing with chronic diarrhea issues, then all of your food is kind of screaming through the system. You don't really have time to assimilate those nutrients, so then the body's not getting what it's needing, and it's going to scream for more or give you some craving issues. Uh, we see in this state, we see a lot of insulin resistance, and we see a lot of issues where the body just seems to be breaking down. It's not really rebuilding and repairing the way that it should. In this overly anabolic state, we see a lot of constipation because the body is sending too much of the water through the kidneys and less through the bowels. So the bowels get hard and dry and, and difficult to move. Now, there's other causes of constipation and all these things that we're talking about. We're just talking about common things that we see when people are dealing with these imbalances. These symptoms are not a confirmation. Oh, I'm, oh, I can't sleep. I must be overly catabolic because we're going to look right here and see that this imbalance can create insomnia for a totally different reason. That's why we don't use things like remedies for insomnia because the only remedy that's going to help one person can make another person with a different cause for their insomnia totally worse. So in an overly anabolic state, we see things like anxiety and tachycardia. And so I just want to give you an idea that when someone's pushing too far in this state, it can create a lot of health issues, but it can also create issues that can make it hard to lose weight. If somebody can't poop like a champion, it's going to be really hard to lose weight. They're not taking out the trash. The waste is not leaving. Do you think it just vanishes? No, the body will store a lot of those toxins in fat cells. So we kind of want to make sure that we're not dealing with major imbalances in these areas because they can create a lot of trouble. So when we are, if we find that we're leaning too far on one side, then we can use specific foods to improve these imbalances. So if you want to figure out if you're dealing with an anabolic or a catabolic imbalance, check out our video on how to know if your circadian rhythm is off, and we'll put the link in the description below this video too. So if you're leaning too far on that catabolic side, you can eat pro-anabolic foods like butter and saturated fats and heavy cream and eggs where the yolk is still kind of runny inside. And these things don't mean, oh, these are the only foods that I can eat, or I have to eat these every day. This just means that when you can eat these foods, you're helping improve an imbalance. If somebody's leaning too far on that anabolic side, they can use pro-catabolic foods, like eggs that are cooked hard, like you know, hard-boiled eggs or scrambled eggs. Uh, they could use olive oil or things like salmon. So if you're dealing with issues that are going to restrict your ability to reach your goals, know that you can adjust your diet to improve those imbalances and help your body optimize how it's running. The next thing we want to look at is, let's look at this oxidation rate. So this has to do with the rate at which we breathe. And you can check this easily, just set it like a kitchen timer for a minute, and then just relax and count the number of inhales that you take in a minute. Don't count inhale as one and exhale as two, just count the inhales. And the rate at which we're breathing gives us a lot of indications on how the body is using oxygen, whether the blood pH may be leaning too far on the acidic or the alkaline side. Either side being out of balance can create a lot of issues. But one thing we can look at is that when our breath rate is greater than that 16 per minute, then that's an indication that we may be oxidizing our proteins too quickly. And we may be ripping through carbohydrates a little too quickly. The body may be kind of predisposed to burn glucose better than fat and not fat as well. And we really want the body to be able to burn both glucose and fat for fuel so that when we have carbs, we can burn those for fuel. And when we're out of glucose, we can burn stored fat for fuel. So we want to burn both and we don't want to have an imbalance. But if our breath rate is over 16, then eating more dark meat protein can help balance out how our body is running a little bit because darker meat protein is harder to oxidize. So if somebody's oxidizing very quickly, they could have a steak and it would take them longer to burn through that and be, oh, I'm out of fuel again. Oh man, I gotta eat something else. Same with this. So if your breath rate is less than 15, then you're having a little bit harder of a time oxidizing those proteins. So white meat protein is easier to burn through. So now you're giving yourself a fuel source that's easier for you to burn. So there's a lot of factors here that we see that we can really customize foods and choices according to what our body chemistry is doing. And here's the best part. You have the ability to adjust. So you can adjust your food choices to go with your body chemistry to help work with your body or 
You also have the ability to adjust your chemistry. You can correct imbalances, you can correct digestive malfunctions, and give yourself a wide variety of foods that will run optimally in your body. So some of these things may take time to correct or to improve imbalances. So you can adjust your food right away to work with your body. And then as you improve the way that your body is functioning, that opens up the door to have more of choices that are gonna work optimally with your body. So it's really great when you can understand how your body is operating and then learn how to work with it. So I know that can be a lot, but the book that you can get for free below will walk you through that. And if you hate to read, we also have a totally free digestion course that walks you through how to look at your body chemistry and digestive functions as well. And I'll put the link to that free course in the description below the video too. For now, since the digestive capacity is pretty much the most important factor that we kind of talked about here in my opinion, why don't you jump over and check out our video on 10 signs of low stomach acid and our other video on 10 signs of poor bile flow so you can get an idea. Are there aspects of digestion that I need to start working on so I can open up the door for more improvement? I can't wait to hear about your results.